Hi guys, Brian from Brian Boas here. Boa constrictors are typically acknowledged as one of the more challenging types of reptiles to reproduce successfully in captivity. But what exactly is success when it comes to breeding boa constrictors? And what is a typical success rate? Sometimes you have to alter your perspective when you're thinking about your future in breeding boas. These are the questions I'm gonna address in today's episode. But first, I thought I would just give a shout out that this is my 500th YouTube video. So I, th I saw that the uh, milestone was approaching the last few months. I thought about doing like a dedicated video. Um, usually I find these types of videos just kind of self-congratulatory and somewhat nauseating when other YouTubers do, do them. So I decided not to do a dedicated video on this milestone, but I thought I would just give a quick shout out. And I wanted to thank everyone who supported me over the last four and a half years or so. We'll have to see how long it takes to get the next 500 videos. The idea for this video came from a few comments I recently got on my YouTube channel. The first is a comment to a video where I said about my success rate in the last breeding season was somewhere around 50%. So about 50% or half of the pairs I paired up resulted in a successful litter. And I think that's a pretty typical success rate overall. You know, I've had better in the past, but you know what, that's probably about what I typically get. You know, with boas, there's just no guarantees. You can do everything right. You can you know, raise your animals responsibly, they're in perfect breeding health, and they're just not interested in each other. And so when I said this in the video, someone commented that they were surprised by this, and they thought that virtually all my pairings were successful, and that, you know, when you put boas together, they're like rabbits or guinea pigs, and they just pump out the babies. That's kind of the impression I got which is really a very unrealistic expectation. I mean, when you breed boas, uh, there's a very good chance that any given pairing is not gonna be successful. And then I got another comment from a guy who runs a boa breeding facility, a farm down in Nikitos, Peru. And, you know, really thank him for his uh, input on this. But he said that, you know, I, I commented that I had a trio of Iquitos Peruvian boas, which likely originated at his farm. I've got two males and a female. I've paired them up, I think twice now. I haven't been successful. And he said that he's not surprised and he doesn't, you know, with that small of a breeding group, he wouldn't expect success. And he has uh, something like 35 pairings going in any given year. So, you know, definitely when you have multiple pairings, it's gonna increase your odds of success. So where is the true barometer for success? And a lot of people online, you know, reptile breeders, they're not gonna be completely transparent with you. People tend to just amplify their successes and they tend to sweep their failures under the rug. They don't wanna talk about them. It's difficult to talk about and maybe it makes people think less of them. So I think there's this unrealistic expectation when you look on Facebook and you see all these litters of beautiful baby boas, uh, that it's much easier than it really is. But when you see a litter of beautiful baby boas, there's many, many months or years of hard work and persistence, as well as luck behind the creation of that litter. I think that many successful boa breeders go through a certain initial period where maybe they have beginner's luck. And I, this certainly happened with me. So my first few years, I got virtually 100% of my pairings led to successful litters. And I'm only talking about, you know, three or four pairings at this point because I'm just starting out. And, uh, but it really gave me kind of an unrealistic indication of how easy it was. In fact, my first red tail pairing, my Surinams in 2014, they just bred like clockwork beautiful litter, no slugs, no stillborns. And yeah, I guess maybe I thought, well, this is a lot easier than I thought it would be. And I think the reason why that's the case is for breeders who don't have that initial lucky period, they probably give up just because they have a more typical result or a really bad result and they get you know, all stillborns or they get no babies or God forbid something happens to the mother, then they're gonna give up. Okay, so only people who've tasted that early luck and that early success, that's, you know, the, the bait that keeps them going. You know, the thrill that they're chasing is to have more litters like that. And so 
obviously with me I kind of scaled up more after the initial few years you know I then I realized well maybe it's not quite as easy as you know I thought I had more pairings that there was just no interest the male had no interest in the female or they didn't breed or even if they bred the female didn't become gravid and then I even had a few females who gave birth prematurely and I had litters of nothing but stillborns which is you know one of the most heartbreaking things you can go through so you know after the initial few years I learned it wasn't quite as easy as it is um, you know I actually did release a few of my projects the projects that I didn't really get as much enjoyment out of and maybe I wasn't successful as some of the other ones at breeding I decided you know to move on to new homes and just kind of more focus my efforts on what I specialize in so I'm hoping that this year I'll have a better success rate. As I mentioned, my success rate last year was about 50% of the pairings resulted in baby boas. Um, you know, hopefully this year, if I could get, you know, two thirds, that would be really good. You know, 65, 70%, that would be a really good result. Um, and I would be really happy with that. But really you have to put in perspective, is it really the quantity or is it the quality? I am thrilled with some of the quality of the boas I produced last year, especially some of my red tails and my Argentines. So even if I didn't have quite the same number of baby boas being born, the quality is just spectacular and you know I really am proud of you know some of these boas that, were, that I bred. In my conversations with other boa breeders who I trust, they've related the same thing that typically they get around 50% or so is a typical year as far as success. And it really varies. They've had years where they have virtually all of their pairings are successful. Other years where hardly any of them are successful. It's kind of like farming. There's just so many variables that go into it. You can have a great year, you can have a typical year, or you can have a year that's a total bust. And I think it's really the people who are committed and despite having a year that's not so good, they just keep on going. You know, maybe next year will be better. They try to take what they learned from that not so good year and apply it to the following year. And with something like breeding boas where it's just as much art as it is science, you really have to take what you learn every year and apply it to the following year. So another uh, area where I think there's a lot of misunderstanding are the sizes of typical boa constrictor litters. And if you look at a lot of the books, they really give you this unrealistic expectation of how big a typical litter is. In fact, I even have some older books. That this one book, they have a picture of a Colombian boa and it just had babies. And there's 26 babies and they all look really beautiful, really nice large litter. And the caption is, you know, 26 babies. This is a small litter for a boa constrictor, right? So small litter. You know, a lot of boa constrictor breeders would kill for a litter of 26. That's about as big as I've ever gotten. And so I think this is just misunderstanding. I think, um, although there are well-documented cases of boa constrictor litters being 80 or even more, this is about as likely as having a boa constrictor that's 13 to 14 feet. It's just, you know, the extreme uh, 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 maximum of the bell curve there. And I would say that a typical boa constrictor size for most locality boas is somewhere between 12 and 15 about babies or so. You know, so I think some of the morph boas might have larger litters. And then some bloodlines, for example, of true red tails will have larger litters. Others have smaller litters. Um, you know, but I think that when people are planning their breeding, especially people who haven't bred before, they might have this unrealistic expectation of how many babies they're gonna get from each litter. And I think, you know, it, you might see the prices of baby boa constrictors and be a little put off, but it's a really expensive, time-consuming process that's very high risk and there's very few, if any, guarantees of success. Um, so this is the reason why some of these prices are where they are. So how do you define success as a boa constrictor breeder? Well, for me, as I mentioned before, it's really more quality over quantity. If I have a few really nice litters, 
that are of animals that I really feel passionate about, it doesn't matter that I'll, you know a lot of the litters uh, did not result, or a lot of the breedings, breeding trials did not result in babies. Um, and this is it's, this is definitely an individual goal, you know, depending on what your previous success rate has been, and depending upon what your objectives are in breeding, it's going to be different for every person. I think the people that are more realistic approach boa breeding like fishing. Okay, there's a reason they call it fishing and not catching because you might just sit on your ass in a boat in the rain all day and get nothing. And that's just part of the process. It's the excitement that keeps people going, the thrill of the hunt. So it's the thrill of breeding the boas that keeps people going in many cases and not the end product. And that's the reason why we keep doing this year after year after year, maybe some of us chasing the initial thrill that we had from our first few litters. I know that's probably part of the reason I keep go going. But another thing to consider is that um, we really should be more concerned about the health of the mother when breeding than whether we get babies or not. And if you breed responsibly, you don't over push your females, you don't breed them too young or too often, you know, then you can probably be more satisfied with being successful in the sense, you know, that your females are doing well um, and nothing bad happened. One of the things that's unspoken about breeding is that breeding anything puts the female at a pretty big risk. And there is a pretty big chance that the female might not make it when breeding, not just for boas, but for pretty much any other animal as well. So if you have a female that goes through breeding trials and emerges in decent health, even if it didn't result in a successful litter, that is a success in my book, you know, that the females up doing well and maybe can breed again in another year or two. Um, some people actually lose females when breeding. I've had a couple females which have become, um, have retained embryos, retained slugs, for example. Um, I had one last, uh, about two years ago, it was a Tarahumara and really concerned that she didn't pass the, sl the slugs. Luckily, she ended up passing them in another couple months. So sometimes they'll have these retained slugs and they're able to pass them on later. Sometimes they end up dying from having these retained slugs or retained, you know, dead embryos, basically, in some cases. Sometimes they end up, you know, dying or sometimes they will just hold on to them and they're not able to breed in the future, but they are able to live a, a normal life. So there's always a risk to the female whenever you breed. Um, and just making it through with a female in decent health is a success. It can also be said there's a risk to the male, and I've seen quite a few stories about people who've had male hemipenes, which have become prolapsed, and the hemipene can't go back in. And you know they try using these folk remedies to get them back in. In some cases, vets can help, but there's also examples of needing to be amputated at the vet. So definitely not the outcome you want for your male, but if your male does have a hemipene amputated, there's a possibility he can use the other one to breed in the future, or at the very least, he's still gonna make a decent pet and can go on and live uh, a normal, healthy life. So, you know, things to think about when you put the perspective of what success means when it comes to boa breeding. Lastly, I just wanted to comment about the degree of control that we have over the boa breeding process. And as I've mentioned many times on my channel, it's really important to get your boas as prepared as possible for breeding. You want them to be the right age, you want them to be in optimal health, great musculature, and you want to pair them up with animals from the same locality, also in great health, who should be genetically compatible. But once you pair the boas up, there's really not a lot you can do. I know there's like tricks to try to induce boas to mate, you know, spraying them with water or putting in a shed skin from another male or, you know, playing very white music, but it just doesn't work most of the time. And one of my friends who is a very well-respected breeder at boas put it the best when he said, what I do is I put the female in with the male and I walk away. So really it's up to the animals at that point. Once you have them paired up, it's up to them if they're going to breed or not. And you just have to keep that in mind. And you really can't be too controlling of the process or too obsessed with everything exactly as it's going on. 
you know, I know that a lot of people like to try to keep records of all of the different milestones in their boa breeding, you know, the pre-ovulation swell, the ovulation, the, you know, post-ovulation, whatever. Obviously the shed you should write down because that tells you when your boas are gonna be due. But there's a lot of this that you just, you don't need to know exactly when everything happened. In many cases, you can't really know. And in many cases, if you keep checking in on your boas, you're just gonna interfere with nature and you're gonna inhibit the process from happening. So what I would say for me, I try to disturb my boas as little as possible. Just let nature take its course. I look for when the female is becoming opaque to go into a post ovulation shed. I look, you know, once or twice a week, I check on and make sure everything's okay. I make, you know, I can also see if there's any kind of courtship activity, any tails wrapped around each other, things like that. But I'm not obsessed about exactly when everything is going on. And I always find it funny on Facebook in the boa groups, you always see these pictures that people have. And, you know, you have, there's a caption like, here's my female Suriname in pre-ovulation swell and that she will ovulate next Tuesday and the litter is due the 4th of July or something like that. And I'm thinking, how can you ever really predict that accurately exactly what's gonna happen? And what's kind of funny is that you rarely see that these people go on and have litters. So they wanna give this impression that they're in complete control of the process when really their success rate may not be very good. Um, I don't know if that makes them feel more like they're in control or you know, maybe other people think that uh, they should listen to these people more. But I'm telling you that it, the more that I breed, the more that I realize how out of control it is to the individual breeder and how much you have to let the animals just do their thing. And of course, observe them, learn from them. Every year you're refining the process and hopefully making it go a little bit smoother. But ultimately, whether the boas, baby boas are born or not is up to the adult boas. A lot of you have been asking me lately about what I'm going to have available in the spring, you know, a few months down the road. And I always keep it vague. Like I don't, I will never guarantee that I'm going to have a certain type of boa until I have the babies on the ground. And for the same reason, animals are not available for sale until they're feeding and established, which is typically about two months after their birth. So I definitely don't want to jinx myself. I typically don't show pictures of my gravid females, other than occasionally I'll do a video where I show, you know, a few of them. But um, I just, you know, there are certain things that I think really should be kept between the breeder and the snakes. And uh, it doesn't have to be something that's constantly being shared on social media and uh, almost made, so I think certain people just, maybe they, they like the attention that they get or something, but um, I would rather just, you know, respect the snake's privacy, let them do their thing. You know, and if the boa gods are smiling, you'll have some baby boas a few months down the road. But anyway, just my two cents on success breeding boas. Anyway, I hope you liked the video. If you have any questions or comments, I'd like to hear below, you know, write what you consider to be success in breeding boas. Thanks for watching and enjoy your boas.